tonight is author, columnist and social media expert Kerry Sackville. Last week, Kerry created the hashtag #EndViolenceAgainstWomen and started a campaign that tweets the names of men who have sent abusive messages to women online. We caught up with her earlier tonight. Hi Kerry, thank you for joining us at The League. Very welcome. Um, now you created the campaign following the barrage of abuse that writer Clementine Ford faced when she reported one of the men who abused her online to his employer and then he subsequently lost his job. Um, one week on from the launch, what has been the response to your campaign? Like, The, the response was enormous. Um, to start with, I just want to stress the, the response was incredibly positive. You know, we. we um, with a trending topic on Twitter within 19 minutes of launching the campaign, it was generating about a thousand tweets per hour. So it was incredibly successful in that sense. Um, of course, there's been uh, feedback that, you know, th there's been um, some negative feedback, mainly from men, occasionally from women. Um, I've received my fair share of abuse, but you know, I get it for three or four days after the campaign. So it, it's pretty easy to take. Clem gets that pretty much every day of her life over and over and over. So, you yeah, know, proved my point. Absolutely. Um, some of the screenshots from her website are just horrifying. And um, I wanted to ask you, actually, like, there seems to be a massive disconnect uh, for people with how they behave online and how they behave in the real world. Like, I don't think people usually attempt to win arguments with a dick pic. But, um, no, I don't know in real life. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they do. Um, but, but what was really surprising for me, what was actually really disturbing, is the number of people who use their real names. And in fact, the people that we called out online were all people who we, whose accounts we verified. They were actually um, tweeting or Facebooking under their real name. A lot of them had profile pictures of themselves with their wives, with their children, with their dogs. And that was even more scary to me than the people who were tweeting or Facebooking under anonymous handles because it shows that they just had absolutely no fear of consequences whatsoever. So people feel quite, um, quite bold um, when, it, when they're sitting behind a computer screen. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Like I know that Facebook introduced that. Um, you know, you have to have your real name, and it was the idea was to make the community safer. But it just really hasn't bothered people at all. Like, and it hasn't. How do we change like a culture, an online culture like that, where people think that they're completely untouchable? It's really difficult, and you know, a lot of people were coming back to me, you know, the critics of, of the campaign, saying, for example, this is a police matter. This isn't for you guys to be to be doing some kind of vigilante work yourselves and going on a witch hunt. And of course, we weren't going on any kind of witch hunt. All we were doing was calling out abuse. There was no abuse directed at um, the people who were the offenders. But my feeling is that the problem is so huge, and the problem is so systemic that. I don't think it can be left, left up to the police to deal with it, particularly when you're talking about abuse that is coming, for example, from the United States. You know, a lot of the men's rights activists were sending and are still sending messages to Clem, to me, to other, other feminist writers. Um, how do the Australian police deal with that? What is our recourse? So I think the answer has to come from within the sites themselves. I think the answer has to come from within Twitter, within Facebook, um, to put boundaries in place and to put um, proper sanctions in place against people who, who abuse the system. Um, it's a big problem, but it needs to be addressed. Right now, to, to even report someone on Twitter is a major issue, and then they can just start another Twitter handle, you know, within five minutes of being blocked. Well, Kerry, you, I mean, you mentioned how um, the police uh, might not be able to, or might find it difficult to kind of, like, enforce these laws. I mean, we just saw earlier this week there was a survey of female officers in Victoria Police, uh, and it was revealed that many female officers uh, are sexually assaulted or threatened even on the police force. So if that kind of culture is within the police force, I mean, how can we kind of expect that this... To, this and that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly the point of this campaign. You know, what people keep saying is things like, well, it's online abuse, it's not real-world abuse, you know, this isn't the same as a woman getting assaulted. But what it showed to me when I was looking at these, at these messages and which made me so alarmed and wanting to actually do something about it was that what it represents, rather than the messages themselves, it represents such a level of misogyny in our culture and it's so endemic. You know, anybody who feels that they can say to a woman they disagree with, you know, I want to rape you with an iron bar, or to call a woman a slut or a whore simply because they don't like her opinion, shows an attitude towards women that is so dangerous. And of course, that attitude is everywhere, including in the police force. Earlier um, in the news this week, uh, the website New Matilda published an article by a self-proclaimed male feminist arguing that feminists mm. could convert more misogynists if they were just a little bit nicer. Um, yeah. Like, this is, though ill-formed, you know, that argument is really deeply entrenched. Do you think that your campaign has helped to open the eyes of those who don't really understand the sort of the horrifying extent of gendered violence online? 
I really hope so, and I think it has. And I think the problem was that people who didn't necessarily follow writers like Clementine Ford had no idea uh, the level of abuse against women online, and the level of violence against women online. And they want us to be nice, and they want us to talk sweetly, and they want us to engage politely. Um, but you know, when you're dealing with, with such horrendous abuse, why can't you speak out? Why should we just sit and nod politely and say, thank you for calling me a slut, thank you for calling me a whore, thank you for threatening to, to rape me, um, but why don't we have a discussion? Um, and, you know, I've, I found it really interesting that a lot of people were making assumptions about the nature of, of the online abuse that we were discussing until they actually saw screenshots. And then it was like, OK, hang on, so this, this is actually a serious problem. And so what I wanted to do by getting these messages um, retweeted out and getting the names of the offenders and retweeting to uh, links to Clem's piece is to show as, as many people as possible the problem, because most people have no idea. Um, it's very easy just to ignore it when it's not necessarily happening to you. Um, and it's very easy to hit that block button when you're getting you know, that kind of abuse maybe once or twice in your online life. But when you're somebody who works in, in the feminist space and is getting that 20, 30, 40 times a day, I mean, it, it acts to, to do what it's intended to, which is to silence women, and that's just not okay. Um, thank you so much, Kerry. Uh, I think that's all we have time for, but it's been really great to hear um, how that campaign's gone and your thoughts on how we can sort of slowly chip away at changing this because we all want to be able to speak and say what we want online and we should all be able to yeah. do that without fear. So Absolutely. It's up to all of us to call it out, to call out um, you know, examples of, of online abuse against women and against everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Great pleasure. What a show, can I just say, what a show tonight. I, I like this show because I get to learn and I get to do the show. And that's what I think is the best thing about it for me. Like, and let's, can we just recap some of the things we learned from today? Like, I personally, I learned that in a fight between Donald Trump and an American bald eagle, it's probably the bald eagle that's going to win. I would, that's what I've taken out of today. Um, I, think, I think my key takeout was that I completely wasted my time and money at art school because a maggot can produce a Jackson Pollock painting? <laughs> <laughs> what was I doing? <laughs> and I learned, if I understood what you were saying earlier about drugs correctly, that we should all take as many drugs as possible. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I got that wrong. <laughs> no, no, it's as many pastries as possible. Pastries, pastries. I'm with you now. You probably should stop taking drugs, Anthony. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's our show for tonight. Thanks to Dr Mel Thompson and Kerry Sackville for joining us. We'll see you next week.